and now uh, to introduce tonight's topic and speakers, MIT Enterprise Forum of the Central Coast board member and partner at SoCal IP Law, Steve Zaraboff. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Matt. I want to, again, thank everybody for coming tonight um, and welcome you. Um, I also want to thank Michael Holliday, the, the chair of, our, uh, of the MIT Enterprise Forum of the Central Coast. I want to thank Matt Stotts, our vice chair. Uh, Matt is in line to be the next chair, and we're looking forward to that someday. Um, I've got a couple of other thank yous. Um, thank yous to some people to help me put this panel together. So uh, I want to thank my friend Stephen Katz, who introduced me to Adrian Sedlin. Um, I want to thank Violet Cotto. Violet, where are you? Violet, I know, is in the room. Hey, everybody, let's hear it for Violet. Everybody, OK? She's pretty amazing. Violet introduced me to, uh, to Max. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say. And I also want to thank uh, Rick Tico, who's also on our board. Um, Rick introduced me to, uh, to Michael. Um, this is a pretty big crowd. And so I just want to take a moment and point out the exits. So we have an exit here, and then we have exits over there. Not that I expect any problems, but you know it is a big crowd, bigger than we normally have, and it's important to keep these things in mind. Um, and I'm kind of curious. So um, how many of you guys have been to a prior MIT event? Just with see your hands. Very nice. Thank you. And how many of you guys first time to an MIT event? Very good. And we hope to see you guys again. Um, and one more question. Um, is anybody in the room with federal law enforcement? <laughs> I'm going to remind you, the exits are there and there. And we would suggest that you leave the room now. So our agenda for tonight, it's pretty straightforward. We have a keynote and, th and three panelists. Our keynote speaker is Adrian Sedlin. He's the CEO of Candescent. We're really, really thrilled to have him here. Um, it's not often that you see a Harvard MBA stepping up to run a cannabis-related business. But the odd thing is, actually, you know, you look at our panelists, and these are business people. Um, normally, when somebody talks about, oh, cannabis, um, you know, we're not necessarily thinking about Harvard MBAs. We're thinking about Cheech and Zhang, I guess. I don't know. Um, but these are all really serious business people. And I can tell you that, that with respect to all of them, they were actually all serious business people, entrepreneurs, and executives before really the cannabis business found them. And, and I am really looking forward to hearing their stories tonight of how, not that they were going out to look for it, but it found them and, and the really amazing things that they see about it and maybe some of the problems that they see ahead. So Adrian's gonna, gonna, gonna speak for about 45 minutes. Then we'll turn the mic over to um, Michael, um, Michael Grillo. Michael is uh, one of the partners of Elite Garden. Elite Garden uh, is in the supply business. So they initially started out as uh, suppliers of fertilizer, and they branched out into other kinds of things, and I'm sure he's going to have great things to talk about that. Also, accomplished business person, several exits. Um, we all have one of these. I don't like to read from these things. I'm sure you guys have all read it, or you can read it later. Very interesting stuff, and I recommend it. Um, third speaker will be Paul Kowalski. Um, Paul is the interim chair of the Cannabis Business Council of Santa Barbara County, and he brings a, a definite um, perspective from that standpoint of what things look like here, particularly in, in the county. Um, and our final speaker, and I set Max up last, Max Simon. He's uh, CEO of Greenflower Media, which is a um, education-oriented media company. Um, if you want to learn all about cannabis, um, how to use it, how to w the healthful qualities, um, how to use it in in salves and lotions and things like that, Greenflower is the place to go, and and they do some pretty amazing stuff. And the reason why I saved Max for last is I was a little concerned that he might be late. Um, one of the things that people often say is, oh yeah, cannabis, it's, it's really bad for fertility. Max is a brand new father. Hey, <laughs> congratulations. But it's not just Max. I can't say as a brand new father, but Adrian, you have how many kids? 
Three kids, all right? That's a real testament. This is great stuff. It's something that we can all believe in. Um, and of course, you know, there's a lot of interest in the room for this topic. Um, and for a lot of it, I think the interest has been there for a long time, but the change here in California last November, where the, the voters by an overwhelming majority decided to um, legalize cannabis for um, not just medical uses, but non-medical recreational uses, it's been a real sea change. Um, we have a licensed regulation system that's gonna roll out um, starting January 1, and really what we're all seeing is the business people running and gunning, you know, raising money, getting ready, so that when the flag drops, everybody's out there heading forward. And what really distinguishes our panel tonight is not that these are people who are new to the business, um, it was really important to us that when we pulled a panel together that we had people that had been in this business for quite some time. And this is, this is not just people who are going to come in and talk about what that they just started, that they've been at it for quite some time and they've got a lot of experience. And that's something that, that is really important that they can share with you. Um, and of course, our topic tonight is the business of cannabis. We're not talking about the health qualities, we're not talking about the moral aspects. Um, and what I will say is after Adrian has his keynote, and then each of the, 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 the other presenters have 15 minutes of their, their bit of fame. We will have a Q&A session, and I will ask you now that limit your questions to issues that are business-related and not issues about health or morality or any other things. This is really where why the audience is here and what we want to stay with. And also, when it comes time to ask questions, they should be questions I don't want to... I don't want to hear your personal statements, your personal stories. Really, this should be questions that are going to be general interest to everybody in the room um, and try to keep it that way. Um, I want to keep everything on a pretty tight schedule. And so with that, um, I know it can be really hard to get a lawyer off a panel and from speaking, but I will turn it over. Adrian, it's all yours. Let's hear it for Adrian Sedlin. Um, you can wander around all, you can wander all you want. Excellent. Hey, everybody. Steve, it's all about the right question. How many people in this room have ever gotten high? <laughs> That's why it's a good business. <laughs> so when Steve invited me to keynote this thing, I was given the challenge. It sounded really good. I, I asked him a couple questions, and he, I said, so tell me about the audience. He said, oh, you know, we'll have people interested in the business, potential investors, maybe people with real estate backgrounds. And he said, all you got to do is talk about the business of cannabis. And it sounded simple. And I said, what should I speak on? He said, I don't know, just talk about the business. I said, I thought about it, and I realized, so you're asking me to describe an industry built by stoners with an unidentifiable talk track to an audience that is not targeted. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm going to do my best. And uh, the way I'm going to go about this is to try to share my experiences about the myths and facts of the cannabis industry. There's a lot of bad information out there. There's some good information, and the best way I can orient you to this industry is just start taking you through some of the lessons that I've learned as to whether or not they're myth or fact. So with that, I'll start. Next slide. Don't have it. Thank you, Steve. Sorry about that. No worries. <laughs> okay, so I've identified nine myths or facts. We'll treat this a little audience as audience participation. It's legal. Yes or no? Cannabis is not legal. I will explain in a bit. Is it medicine? Yes. yes, cannabis is medicine. Is it an industry? Yes. It is an industry, my opinion. 
Cannabis is a commodity. Cannabis is not a commodity. The industry is for everyone. The industry is not for everyone. It's too late to enter. I would agree with you, it's early days. It's profitable. Way, way long time from now it is. If you start a business now and you're running it tightly uh, and you're poisoning yourself for the future, you will make money eventually. Uh, early days will not be profitable. It's unbanked. Sort of. We'll get to that one. It's getting trumped. Uh, I'll share a little information that, that we have on that. I am the, one of the co-chairs of the NCIA Policy Committee, uh, so we run the lobby into Washington, D.C., so I do have a little information, uh, but we'll get to that towards the end. So, cannabis. I'm not an advocate, for sure, but when you enter the cannabis industry, you have to become one. So, I willingly entered an industry where the day I started in it, I decided that I would be committing repeated federal offenses. By definition, that makes me an advocate. Cannabis is illegal under federal law. It currently stands on Schedule One under the Controlled Substances Act. I've put the four primary schedules up there it is listed on the most dangerous schedule, along with heroin, LSD, and peyote. Below that, you may see oxycodone. How many people know cannabis, any cannabis addicts in the room? Anyone know anyone ever get addicted to oxycodone, Vicodin, Xanax, Valium? These things all fall, fall on lower governmental schedules. I'm, again, not here to be an advocate, but I am here to educate. You'll hear a lot, and especially recent, recently, Sean Spicer's comments talking about, well, the medical stuff, you know, that's okay, but, you know, there's recreational stuff, uh, you know, that's not legal. There's no such thing as medical cannabis under federal law. There's no provisions for it. It's on Schedule 1, and what Schedule and I'll give you the basic definitions of Schedule 1 and what that means, but when I go into the medical aspects of cannabis, but right now, we have a situation where we are illegal, illegal under federal law, but we have 44 states that have permitted some form of medical cannabis, and we have eight states that have permitted recreational cannabis. So what we have, as my son would say, is a big cluster. Uh, but we're in California, so I'll talk a little bit about California. Uh, we have two primary laws that have been passed recently to regulate cannabis. In, no, in October of 15, November, sorry, October, November of 15, we passed the Medical Cannabis Regulation and Safety Act. And then the voters of California recently voted on what's known as Prop 64 or ALMA. Both of those are targeted at regulating the cannabis industry. They do not really further legalize the cannabis industry in California. That was done through Prop 215 and SB 420, which were passed a long, long time ago. So all the stuff you may hear right now, oh, it's legal now. What they're doing is regulating it now. So the industry, the state has decided to embrace it, pass laws, and right now uh, there's a lot of people up in Sacramento defining things of how it's all going to work. And right now there's about 17 different license types available. There's everything. There's 10 different types of cultivation licenses depending whether you want to be in a greenhouse, whether you want to be outdoor, whether you want to be indoor cultivators. There's also transportation licenses, distributor licenses, uh, testing lab licenses, and dispensary licenses. 
In order to get one of those licenses, first you need to have a municipal permit so you can apply to the state. And then what you will have is you will have your local license. When the state says what the application process is, hopefully January of 2018, you'll then be able to apply for a state license if you have a local permit. And all that effort will give you what we call a very solid defense. <laughs> uh, so where do the feds stand on it right now? We're kind of operating under this loose framework that was established by something people in the industry know as the Cole Memo. It was written by an attorney general. And there's been a number of additional pieces added to the Cole Memo and, and additional uh, letters by the attorney general's office over time that the Cole Memo basically says, you know, the state-based thing might not be so bad if you don't do one of those eight nasty things like sell to minors, get involved with guns, get involved with gangs. And they've progressively gone a little further in saying, you know, maybe you could even be banked if you were state compliant. But the key to the industry in having a good defense is being state compliant. And that's really all an operator in, who's touching the plant in the industry. So if you want to be a cultivator, a dispensary, a delivery service, a testing lab, if you're touching the plant, all you have is a decent defense. Now, the good news is we actually got some court precedent recently uh, in the last year. The Ninth Circuit Court basically upheld uh, Rohrabacher Farr, which is an amendment uh, to the, that Congress passed, which basically defunds all cannabis enforcement by the federal government. But Rohrabacher Farr is an annual re-upped amendment. So right now, I am a state compliant operator under California law. So in, I have the luxury of knowing until April 17th of this, com of this year, I'm good. We'll see if it gets extended. The most important advice I could give to anyone thinking of entering this industry is be one of the good guys. There's a right and wrong way to do it. There's a lot of people who've been in the industry a long time and you know, they fought the great fight to bring the industry where it is today but now it's gonna be a highly regulated industry and you need to participate within that industry. So I write regularly for MG Magazine. I serve on uh, the California Advisory Committee for Cannabis Cultivation. You need to engage the industry and open your doors. So I regularly tour, tour state and local officials who have no bearing on my company or our future through our shop because I want them to see that cannabis is safe, and as a, as a result, yes, I'm building a market, I, I believe, but ultimately, I have a job as an advocate within the industry. And that's basically a decision to be in cannabis is a decision to be an activist. There's no two ways about it. So now I want to show you why. Jaden's seven years old now. Jaden was, uh, was born perfectly healthy. At four months old, Jaden had his uh, first seizure. It was just a downhill road for there for the next few years. She's having 500 like twitching myclonic seizures a day. He'd have grandmas for an hour, hour and a half. I remember he was crying from like one o'clock at night to like nine in the morning, screaming, crying in pain. He was seeing things. He was hallucinating from the medications. At four and a half, Jaden was um, taking uh, 22 pills a day. He was at 25,000 pills he had taken by the time he was five years old. Jaden had tried 12 different medications. We had 40 ambulances because we were fighting with the insurance companies all the time. We lost our house, we lost our cars, we lost our business, we lost our family. I went to UCSF. I said, look, I don't think Jaden's gonna make it another week. What do you suggest? They're all, you know, I don't know. I mean, I would try anything. I go, what do you think about medical marijuana? They're all, well, like we said, you think we're a life in that situation, you should try anything. So I said, all right. I went and picked up something I saw in a, in a dispensary. Came home, I gave it to Jaden. After four and a half years of having my clonic seizures, 500 a day and twitching and head drops and seizing, the first day I gave it to him was, thank God, one million times. It was the first day he's ever went seizure free in his life. And then after that, second day, third day, fourth day, 
the seizures were down dramatically. I could see his eyes lighting up. It was summertime. It was June 1st, the first day I gave it to him, 2011. He started swimming. Jaden's never been able to swim before. The sudden temperature change of water would give him a seizure. Boom, I put him in the front yard, and my neighbor's like, oh my gosh, we've never seen him in the front yard. They're so excited. They're cheering him on. I started weaning him off the medications after one month I was on the, on the CBD. Every time I took him off, he would suffer for two weeks, and boom, he'd become more human. Then take off another pillow, suffer for two weeks, boom, become more human. Jaden started chewing. Jaden was only eating Gerber food all, all the way until he was five years old. He started chewing. With taking 25,000 pills, it really wears on your body and brain, so it was kind of recovering more from the medications than from the epilepsy. And we decided to wean off the hardest one, benzodiazepines. He was having um, tremors, nightmares, brain zaps. I've contacted uh, 30 different benzo withdrawal clinics. They go, how old is the person that's coming on that, that you want to bring into our clinic? I tell them, seven years old. And they scream at the top of your, their lungs. Every single one vividly say the same exact thing. You have a seven-year-old on benzos? Because we have people here that are football players. We have people here that are big, tough guys that are dying, literally dying from benzos. And you have a seven-year-old on it? I said, seven-year-old? My son's been addicted to it since he's 16 months old. So now we have to figure out a way to wean them off by ourselves because the benzo detox clinics are not willing to take in a seven-year-old. Since we've been using the CBD, he's, he's been doing amazing. It has under 1% THC, so it doesn't give you that euphoria. Second thing is it's abstracted, it's organic. We know the dosaging, the milligrams. We're in the forefront of something huge. It's either you're going to give up and just let your son be your child be a vegetable and die, or you're gonna sit there and fight. I still haven't met Jaden yet. I know Jaden in 22 pills, but I'm down to Jaden in two pills. That's who I know right now. I don't know Jaden, but on medication. Christmas before Jaden was born, that was my Christmas gift, was that Jaden was gonna be born. My ex-wife had to give me a box. I opened it and I remember, <sighs> it's a hard one. I remember opening the box and seeing a pregnancy test and saying positive with two baby shoes and then having so much expectation, you know? Having so much expectation that, uh, you know, you're gonna have your son. As a parent, you're expecting, you know, your child to play football, you're expecting your child to talk, you, you know? <laughs> I mean, right now, my, my number one goal right now is to have my son say, I love you. I mean, people take for that for granted. <sighs> people take that for granted. <laughs> Their kids could talk and say, I love you. That's all I want to hear my son say. But I mean, if I could hear him say that, I'll be more than happy. He said it one time on CNN, I la lu, he was really close. But um, I got to hear it. I mean, if, if he says that, I've already conquered the world. Seeing your child suffer, there's nothing worse than that. There's no torture worse than that, especially every day. I've been in the industry for about two years now. I've personally met hundreds of stories like Jaden, like Parkinson's sufferers, like chemo patients, like people who've had stage four cancer and it's gone down to stage two. Um, is it medicine? Unfortunately, I can't even call it that because we don't get clinical trials in our industry, so technically it's not medicine because the FDA won't hear cl clinical trials. However, and they won't hear them because we are on Schedule 1, so let's dig into that definition for a second. There is a two-pronged definition to what it means to be a Schedule 1 drug. It means no medical applications whatsoever, and it's highly addictive. There is one patent that's ever been issued in the cannabis industry. It was issued to the National Institute of Health, part of the US government. The patent claims exclusive right on the use of cannabinoids, the active chemical com compounds in cannabis for treating neurological diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and stroke in diseases caused by oxidative stress such as heart attack, Crohn's disease, diabetes, and arthritis. 
And I quote, the patent asserts cannabinoids have been found to have antioxidant properties. These new found properties make cannabinoids useful in the treatment and prophylaxis of a wide variety of oxidation of associated diseases. The cannabinoids are found to have particular application as neuroprotectants or in the treatment of neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and HIV dementia. So, to be clear, the federal government owns a patent against the medical uses of cannabis. Uh, is it highly addictive? The, NI, uh, the NIH uh, did a study on the addictive properties of cannabis vis-a-vis -a, -vis a number of other substances. And what you will see is cannabis, when it has a high degree of THC in it, is a psychoactive substance. It does create euphoria. And that euphoria has some level of reinforcement. But when you measure it for the things we normally would associate with the addiction, dependence, withdrawal, and tolerance, it's less than coffee. And I can tell you how addictive coffee is because I just spent the weekend in New York City and there is a Starbucks on every corner. <laughs> so, not really addictive. Clearly has some medical applications, yet we're waiting in, on schedule one. It doesn't make any sense. But then you'll hear arguments that it's a gateway drug. It leads to bad things. There's never been a study proving that it's a gateway drug, and I will tell you one of my favorite jokes when I was five. It's about a scientist and a frog. Frog, he puts a frog on a starting line, and he says, jump, frog, jump. Frog jumps 20 feet. Then he decides to cut off one of the frog's legs. Puts him back on the starting line. Says, jump, frog, jump. Frog jumps about 10 feet with three legs. Then he decides to go for it. Cuts off all the frog's legs. Puts him on the starting line. Jump, frog, jump. Frog doesn't move. Jump, frog, jump. Frog doesn't move. Scientist writes in his journal, frog with no legs goes deaf. There is a large difference between collinearity and causality. If everyone in this room held their breath, we all will die at some point. We could hold our breath for a second and we will all die maybe in five years, 10 years, 100 years. But we cannot say the fact we held our breath in this room is causal of our death. So really, you know, when it comes to addiction, the best expression I've ever heard of it is there's hiders and seekers. You know, if you're using any substance to solve pain, process issues, it's probably not a good long-term idea. It's why I'm violently against it for children. You know, we need to spend our youth processing, not medicating. But if you're seeking, Cannabis might be an interesting way to find your inner self or potentially use your endocannabinoid system to heal yourself. I won't spend my time uh, giving you a further lecture on the science of how cannabis works with your CB1 and CB2 receptors, but rest assured, your body is regulated. The cells in your body are regulated by the endocannabinoid system. And what cannabinoids do is help mediate the communication between your cells. So are we an industry? Yes, we are. So a bunch of us over the years have stood up, got involved, and I want to give you a little framework for maybe how to digest it all. On the far left, we have our trade associations. Associations, they're a fantastic source for people who want to learn more uh, about the industry. There's the NCIA, that's the National Cannabis Industry Association. In the state of California, the kind of sister organization is the CCIA, California Cannabis Industry Association. 
both of those I'd say are more business oriented trade groups. Then you have the more activist oriented ones like Americans Safe for Safe Access and Normal, a lot of people probably know that. And then somewhere in between the two, the business and the more activist oriented ones, you have something like um, the Marijuana Policy Project. The heart of the industry touches the plant and we have cultivation. Those are the guys who grow it. Then we have extraction. Those are the guys who turn it into oils. Then we have concentrates. And sometimes you take those oils and we can turn them into other substances, more concentrated versions. Um, that's more of a recreational product for most. Then there's edibles. Edibles, you've probably heard of them. They can be everything from a gummy to a chocolate bar. I've seen mints, I've seen sodas. Uh, you can pretty much put cannabis oil in anything. Uh, you have tinctures, creams, salves. All of those are oil-based product. Uh, I know people who've had phenomenal pain relief just by rubbing it on their shoulders if they have neck pain or arthritis. Uh, and because we are an industry, just like any green rush, you have some crazy ideas. There is a company called Bettables that's doing cotton candy infused cannabis products. Uh, and I warn everyone, there's a lot of craziness out there about, hey, let's put cannabis in, a, in everything, and we'll speak about how the industry will unfold and maybe where the, if you're an investor, how you wanna place your bets, or if you're interested in moving forward in the industry, uh, how to maybe think about what you wanna do. Then there's the distribution side of the business. I put testing labs under that. Uh, but they test all the products that will come to market. You have transporters, think about them like trucking companies that will, ha will have special licenses. You have distributors who, depending on which lobby wins out as the regulations get in implemented, uh, you'll have a lot of the out uh, traditional three-step supply chain where you have manufacturers, distributors, and retailers. And then finally you have your dispensaries and delivery services. Then, on the far left, you have everything that supports our industry. And I'll tell you, it's a big business out there. So there's nothing you can imagine in business that cannabis industries don't eventually need to buy. So we buy packaging, we need law lawyers, we need accountants, we need everything you can imagine. So if you're thinking about how can I play the industry, Maybe you're just a service provider who learns about the industry and starts building a client base if you don't want to directly get involved. But I can tell you there's a, a lot of robot suppliers out there and we desperately need better ones. There's a lot of people who got involved early who don't bring professional execution to the table. And so if you're a world-class supplier and you're willing to serve a cannabis client, I'm sure you'll win business. So, Yes, we're an industry, we're a fairly large industry, and I can tell you it's really eye-opening, and I would encourage if anyone's thinking, has never been to a trade show in the industry, it was crazy for me. Uh, the first time I went is I went to a trade show, and I've been in, and I, this was at the point I was sending all my emails, texts, and calls on 100% encryption, and I go into, you know, trade show rooms that I've been in before, hundreds of times in other industries, and there's lots of people with booths talking about cannabis in the open. I'm like, okay, I get it now. This is actually happening. So our industry right now, is, con especially in the state of California, is what I would describe as highly conflated. So in 1998, we allowed for the medical use, but we didn't regulate it. And then a lot of adult users decided to get their own prescriptions uh, so they could, and we, we call it medicating in the industry, so they could medicate for more adult use purposes. So as a, as a result of being a shadow industry, uh, we had the industry just, that wasn't regulated well, that wasn't allowed to grow into medicine, and really wasn't allowed to pursue the natural extension of what an adult use product, we kind of have this hodgepodge of it that's a mess. But one of the most important things to understand now is this industry is going to cleave very quickly and there will be 
Hardcore medical companies, think Pfizer, Amgen, high-end biotech, if you don't know how to clean room, run a clean room, you should not be in that industry because that is where the medical side of this business is. And you need to think about the skill set you bring to the table in relationship to the side of the business you want to put, and you pick that point on the wall and say, this is what I'm going to serve. Then there's the adult use side. That's more, much more like a spirits company or a tobacco company where it's a lot about marketing and distribution and how do you build brand. My company, Candescent, that's our focus point. It has been from day one. I don't have a background in clean rooms. I don't have a background in clinical trials, so it wasn't appropriate for me to try to run that one down. I'm a huge advocate for the medical side of the business. It's just not what I do well. So I think if you're going to think about playing this industry, however you're going to play it, either directly or as an investor, make sure that the people you're getting involved with have a highly differentiated strategy and idea of the business they're getting in and the appropriate backgrounds. Because if I were to tell you, well, we grow great cannabis, we are a cannabis cultivator, and we're going into the medical side of the business, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Because when you think about hardcore medicine, that's probably the use case is probably not smoking. So understand what your investment or company you're looking at or whatever you're doing, where it's going, and understand that these industry, the industry is going to break apart very quickly and profoundly over the next, and they'll be just as different as biotech and an alcohol company. And the competencies you'll need to succeed are those. Cannabis as a commodity. This is one I get all the time especially from the Wall Street bankers on the East Coast. Well, prices are going to drop. Cannabis is no more of a commodity than wine or wheat. There are generics in the pharmaceutical industry, but then the branded products. I don't think Viag Viagra does everything it can do to hold on to its patents so the generics can't come in, and you can name that for any type of prescription drug, but ultimately, those branded drugs are not commodities. On the adult use side, how many people in this room drink alcohol? Oh, come on. <laughs> you know, you can drink Two Buck Chuck, or you can drink Screaming Eagle, or uh, Opus One, if you're a wine person. There's high-end beers, there's low-end beers. There's high-end vodkas, there's low-end vodkas. They all sell for different prices. And if you look, if you need the data to understand why this industry right now is so far from a commodity, look at the average revenue per user. This is an industry of raving fans. If anyone ever wants to go on Instagram and look up cannabis, you will see a profound nation of people who dedicate their lives to taking pictures of Bud and talking about cannabis. I've never seen a more active constituency to be candid in any industry. I mean, so, and this is an industry of connoisseurs on the adult use side. People know their product. I, I would describe it as, an, on the adult use side, as an entire industry of sommeliers. They can tell good product, and the amazing thing about it, cannabis is it's a very aspirational purchase. People tend to bring, their, because of the pro supply chain in alcohol is mature, people tend to drink their price point. Not the same in cannabis. You, can, you will find a welfare mom reach for top shelf cannabis every day of the week. No one wants to consume the bad stuff in our industry, and there's a lot of reasons for that because the supply chain is so immature. And there's not a lot of trust between manufacturer and end user. So price point is a proxy uh, for value, safety. Just as a quick example and how messed up the supply chain is right now, in LA, uh, a TV station did an expose on a dispensary, uh, actually seven dispensaries. They bought 44 products, 41 tested positive for pesticides. That's why we need to be regulated. But. If you want to really understand where this industry is going, the answer is most definitely on TV. And what I mean by that is when I was young, on a bad Thursday when there was the four channels I was looking at, I would get roped into watching Bob Ross paint. 
because I had four channels. Now we have a thousand. That's where the cannabis industry is going to go. It's going to be that segmented where you have brands targeting women, where you have specific medical drugs targeting only Parkinson's patients, only cancer. So think about you need to succeed in the industry long term, laser like focus. And right now, from the beginning, my company focused on high end adult use cannabis. So, can everyone do it? Should everyone do it? It's kind of a mess out there. I would say if you're used to not being spoon-fed and like to figure things out for yourself, this is definitely the interest, uh, industry for you. It's a blank sheet of paper. You can hire lots of lawyers to explain you cannabis law. The best thing you can do is just read the laws yourself. You're going to have to piece together your own thesis. There are no pros. I can tell you the largest management company, management cultivation company in the industry just got fired from all its clients in Las Vegas. There's a reason for that. Uh, the pros, they might not even be pros. So right now, you're just going to have to figure it out for yourself. It's a very dynamic industry. You have to be super comfortable with uncertainty. It changes all the time. We talk about it all the time at Candescent. We're building the plane while flying the plane. Uh, it's great to budget, and I believe in budgetary discipline, but I'm fully, how do you build a budget around, hey, our price is gonna go up or down in the next three years. I, can, I, I know a guy. He raised a $100 million fund. His thesis is prices are going up in California. I could pit, pit him against 100 other guys in the industry that are saying prices will go down. So try budgeting against that. The most important thing I can tell you about the industry as it grows apart and as it grows is whoever, whatever you choose to do in the business, get out there and make sure that business solves a real problem in the industry. I'm not here to talk about candescent, but I am here to just use it as a little case study of how we thought about it and how we approached it. First, we identified there was a scarcity of high-end product. So we wanted to be, focus on the high end. Well, how do you do that? You bring everything in your cultivation site again, aligned against ultra premium. You bring everything in your organization aligned against ultra premium. We have highly controlled grow rooms down to the square inch. So there were 100 guys I talked to as consultants in the industry as we were going in. They said, you will go out of business if you don't have what's called a sea of green. If you're not in a greenhouse with plants as far as the eye can see, you won't be able to compete. It's just not true because they can't control their rooms. So again, first you identify the problem and then you solve against it within your business. It's no different than any other industry. Second thing is we realize there's no consistency in our industry. So you have a great product experience. How do you get that product again? There's a thousand people growing the 6,000 different strains. So a product experience has as much called like Blue Dream or train wreck, whatever strain is your preference, it has as much in common as a grapefruit and a kumquat. So there's no consistency of experience. And then you're dealing with names like, excuse my French to any children in the room, Alaskan Thunderfuck, German Poison, uh, <laughs> train wreck, headband, Lucky Charms. So whether or not they're infringing on someone else's trademark, it's not the type of thing that most Montecito moms want to ingest because it just doesn't sound like it's good for you. <laughs> so, you know, we looked at that and it may seem simple, but we needed to come up with a brand architecture in our company to say, we got to cut through this noise. And we made the choice to abandon all strain names. And a lot of people think we're crazy. We sell our products under Calm Cruise, Create, Connect, and Charge because we think that's more relatable. The other thing I would say is you got to look at the imagery in our industry. It's all boobs and doobs out there. So, you know, we've chose to be a high-end adult use brand. So our product comes packaged 
in a magnetic box that you can trust, wafer sealed, prepackaged with rolling papers. Hopefully we can circulate some of those boxes around the room so people can see what it looks like. But the idea is my tar is aligning against my target audience, giving them an experience where they can have the psychographic expression that they need as an end user. Because if you guys remember how computers were back in the day, and then the iMac came out with fun colors, in the high-end adult use business, there's really no way for someone to differentiate themselves as a consumer, because we have an immature supply chain that doesn't give people to say, oh, this is reflective of who I am as a customer. Whether you drive a Hyundai or a Range Rover, that may be a price point decision, but at some level you are expressing yourself, and cannabis is no different from the person who drinks Kettle One, Grey Goose, Smirnoff, or the hundred other vodkas that are out there. So the point I'm just trying to drive out here under, if you're involved in the industry, make sure you're solving a real problem and then you align against it. It's just like any other business. Is it too late? I don't think so. Personally, I think we're at the forefront of a 50-year secular trend. The reason I think that is uh, last year, my oldest son graduated from, eight, from eighth grade, and I went to a crane party. He, went, he goes to Crane Country, or did graduate from Crane Country Day, and it was a fantastic party, great event, 30 couples right on San Ysidro Lane. Think about canapes, tray pass, gorgeous house. And I noticed of the 30 couples, maybe eight brought a bottle of wine as a gift to the hostess. I also noticed there was a full bar where the host and hostess were providing <coughs> beer, hard alcohol, and a number of different wine options. There was not one person who brought a carafe of cannabis. <laughs> there was not one person. Uh, I couldn't go up and say, hey, what do you have at the dab bar? Half the people here probably don't even know what that is. Uh, <laughs> So it wasn't an option. So how do we go? I mean, if you look globally, I mean, you t there was actually an interesting experience I had. There was a couple from Sweden at that party, and, I, and they asked me what I did, and I shared it with them, and I got a very stunned reaction, because if anyone knows anything about Swedish culture, they truly believe cannabis is as dangerous as heroin. And they treat it as such, societally. It, so is it too late? No, because it's going to take 50 years to drive that little level of change where it becomes commonplace, where you're at a ballpark, and when you can go up and get a beer, you may be able to just purchase some cannabis or some cannabis-based product. And that level of change, and that is the 50-year growth trend we're looking at. And if you don't believe that's going to happen, check the facts. Alcohol, cannabis. Highly addictive, not addictive. High calorie, no calorie. <laughs> Destroys your liver, doesn't hurt your liver. <laughs> Gives you a really bad headache, right as rain. The change is going to happen, guys. And we're really at the top of the second industry. And the reason I put this slide up here is every one of those search engines was launched before Google. Does anyone know the, does anyone even know the first one that was launched up there? Yes, sir. Give that man something. <laughs> it's not too late. If you have a highly differentiated approach to the industry or you're investing in a company, hey, you know, I don't know if I'm the next overture, the next Excite, and gonna be sold for scrap. I remember Excite at home, they had a $7 billion valuation. Two and a half years later, they sold for 2.4 in a wreck of bankruptcy. Two, that's 2.4 million, by the way. It's definitely not too late. It's definitely a secular growth trend. And if you're interested in playing it, just be careful about who you bet on and what they have to deliver. Oops. Is it profitable? I don't think so. And I don't think anyone should be looking 
for it to be profitable. I'll tell you why. Whether you call it the green rush, it is a race to scale out there. If I wanted to, we, we right now operate 12,000 square feet down in, right outside of Palm Springs, and we will bring online in my company 123,000 square feet over the next 18 months. There's no way to run a profitable company or a cash flow positive company when you are reinvesting that strongly in the business. So I would say run quickly from the plan that says, hey, guess what, you know, I'll get you paid back in a year and a half and you'll be getting 30% returns on your money. Why? Those people will not have the scale to compete. This is going to be a deep pocket scheme run by very serious b businesses. And if you're trying to make a quick buck in cannabis, it'll be very, very short-lived. So that said, don't expect profits, don't expect positive cash flow over the long term, I mean in the short term. That said, I will tell you this is the best risk-adjusted return I've ever seen in my life over the long term. How often do you get to build a product where there's known global demand and no one has more than a couple basis points of market share. That's a once in a, potentially once in a generation, if not multiple generation. And then it just comes down to can you execute? Is that, so I would look for more than anything else in this business, a team if you're investing or if you're going into the business, make sure they can execute against the play they're trying to run. Is it banked? Come on, guys. Do you really think the people in Colorado have mountains of cash? There's guys doing $100 million of business. You don't think they've solved against it? There's 300 federally chartered banks. If you spend two hours of research, you'll figure out who some of them are who are willing to bank a cannabis business. And if you can't figure it out, I would suggest there's 5,000 bank locations within the state of California, you need one. How do you get the one? Well, I'll tell you something that I spent a lot of time just trying to understand, but if you're gonna invest right now in the cannabis industry, I'd say you gotta look for the right structure. Using my company as an example, we have the one that touches the plant and then the one which, and then we have our management company which our investors are in. So. My management company is a consulting company. We just consult to the cannabis company. That helps us navigate regu IRS regulation 280E. It also keeps our bank accounts open. So it, banking is something the press really likes to run with, but if you have sophisticated people or you should be able to figure out the banking solution, I can tell you all of our banks have walked my grow facility. So then you know exactly what and how we do it. We're just very transparent about it. And the only thing you can't do is ask anyone in the industry who they bank with, because they will not tell you. Now, the million dollar question. What about the next four years? What's happening? Are we about to get Trump? We've heard Sean Spicer's comments. We've heard Attorney uh, Jeff Sessions' comments. The best feedback we have at the NCIA is the industry is safe. What does that mean? And when they're talking about all this enforcement that's about to come, I'm in the regulated cannabis industry. I love the enforcement. Please put the black market out of competition. Please put the gray market out of competition. And you know what? And the more Trump, Spicer, Sessions, they, they talk negatively about it. This is the thing I've learned in marriage over 16 years. You can't love them in slices, and you can't love our industry in slices. And if you don't think the current stuff that's coming out is keeping a positive risk premium in the business, that's phenomenal for me. So you got to understand you can't love just part of the industry. So the fact that it has such high returns right now is because it is a little spooky. There's nothing better for someone participating in the regulated cannabis industry 
than for it to stay on Schedule 1 for a while. Sounds a little scary, but I love the idea, because Schedule 1 keeps Pfizer, keeps Amgen, keeps all the big tobacco companies out of the industry. They can't afford the headline risk because they will get so many shareholder and class action lawsuits the, the day they announce um, that they can't really get in the industry. So you can look at it, and all the, all the rhetoric is, and the current indications are they are not coming out of state after state compliant operators. And that is phenomenal for the people who are building scale right now. So I'll close but with just a couple quick videos and I look forward to hearing what the rest of the panel has to say. The first is to really express to you, you know, where we've come from as an industry and where we're going. So video one. Hey, you want to get high, man? That's how they do, they got wooden balls, man. Now, I got a joint here, man. I've been saving for a special occasion. No. Play on fire, though. Uh, hey, I hope the drums don't mess up your upholstery, man. Nah, I'm in a band, too, man. Oh, are you? Yeah, I'm a lead singer, man. Ah, that's it, Yeah, man. we play everything from, like, Santana to El Chicano, man. You know, like everything. Hey, I'm just a love machine. And I don't work for nobody but you. I'm just a love machine. And I don't work for nobody but you. Well, when my temperature rise, and then I go for her thighs. And then I say, guacamole in my shoes. Guacamole in my shoes. Hijo de la chinga. Is that a joint, man? God damn, it looks like a, a quarter pounder, man. <laughs> hey, be careful with that shit, man. Uh, well, is it heavy stuff, man? <laughs> Will it blow me away? <laughs> put your seatbelt on, man. I'll tell you that much. I've been smoking since I was born, man. I could smoke anything, man. You know, like I smoked that Michoacan, man, Acapulco Gold, man. I even smoked that tight stick, you know? Tight stick? Yeah, you know, that stuff is tied to a stick, you know? Oh, yeah, tight that, stick. Yeah, that didn't even do nothing to me, man. I could probably smoke this whole joint, man, and still walk away, man. Wouldn't be no problem at all, man. Talk, talk it up, man. Do nothing to me. It kind of grabs you by the boo-boo, don't it? Hey, man. What? What? Oh, <laughs> what was in this shit, man? Mostly Maui Wowie, man. Yeah? But it's got some Labrador in it. What's Labrador? It's dog shit. What? Yeah, my dog ate my stash, man. I had it on the table and the little motherfucker ate it, man. Yeah? So I had to follow him around the little baggie for three days before I got it back. It really blew the dog's mind. You mean we're smoking dog shit, man? Your yeah, I know. Up and up, up and up and I'm singing his song. All the little birds on the This is where we're going. Pretty terrific. Adrian, thank you so much. Um, never cease to amaze. 
All right, so next up, Michael Grillo from... Um, Thank you, Elite Garden. I had one of those moments of, of lacking of clarity um, and talking about yet a different side of the business and maybe a different perspective. Maybe a little bit, a little bit. Can you guys hear me? Is this still working? Because I've been moving around. Uh, good evening, thanks for being here. Thanks again to Adrian, that was spectacular. Uh, I like the way he brings up the sea of green guy right after the guy who uh, uh, isn't the sea of green, so that's just perfect. Um, let this thing come up. I'm with Elite Garden. Uh, I'll be brief, I'll go as fast as I can. Um, are we, who's putting that up? Or a uh, local company. Uh, four guys started it. I'll show you a quick picture and tell you how we fit into the space. Um, I think Steve touched on a couple of things. Um, all of us recently came out of recent exits, uh, and then the conversation emerging in this market uh, partnered up. Um, all of us have known each other in varying ways over some of us quite a few years. Uh, so, thanks, perfect, as I speak to a blank screen. Where is the, there it is, okay. <coughs> this is the founders of the company, and the only reason I just put up us is because we haven't moved into our new office until next week, so we haven't had enough room to take a picture of the entire team, um, which is an important part of mine. Uh, former president of Ergomotion, which most of you might know, fast-growing bed tech company in town, uh, myself without a jacket on. This is the former founder of Rock Nutrients, which was a, a, a company in the space that's been built up and done very well. Uh, and a lot of you probably know Graham. He's ubiquitous around town. Um, uh, one of the early Sonos guys. He's on a bunch of boards. Um, quick, four guys, eight companies. We'll, we'll get into that. Uh, eight exits. We're all entrepreneurs. Um, product, product in finance and consulting product guy, cannabis guy. Um, yeah, Adrian was speaking about being in your wheelhouse. We formed the business around being in our wheelhouse, but we're guys with a decent amount of experience at this point. So to his point, you know, stay in your lane, good advice anyway, but I think it's particularly apt in this case. A lot of you are probably wondering, or I'm, I'm going to guess, people want to know, how do you get into the space? So I'll tell you my path. You're a Boy Scout. You go to one of those expensive colleges like Adrian did, right? You go to IBM, you start your first company, which is a management consultancy. You go get more overeducated by getting an MBA. You start a hedge fund. You move to the West Coast, and a buddy calls and says, hey, I need help. We're growing the business. We're going to go through a transaction. And then you become a weed guy. That's my path. Uh, well, my attorney's in the room. Friends of mine are in the room. They all know this. Uh, the point I want to make is you know, twofold. It is about rigorous business experience. It is about all the points that Adrian made about running a business, about you know, a, a budgetary rigor, about that sort of discipline. Uh, I do think, I'm one of those guys, prices are going down. Um, I don't know how much they're gonna do what we've seen in other markets. They're gonna go up a bit as we see licensing come into play in 2018. Uh, and then we'll see the decline that we've seen in a lot of other markets. I do think for branded ultra premiums and the like, that's going to be one of the places where we see the market going, I see the market going, and where I think we very strongly agree. Um, what we do, uh, Steve told you we're a supplier. We're actually a couple of things. Uh, we have, we started with the idea of products and management, and we've migrated left to right over time. We have commercial business, we have a retail business. I'm going to show you some numbers. I'm not going to open the kimono and tell you everything about our business, but I'll give you some guys idea on growth rates and scale and kind of talk about some other places in the market. I'll show you some pictures that may get your attention. Um, what, we, what we really do is incubate new products in this space. We look into commercial and retail markets, see where there are gaps, develop better products. And there's lots of opportunity for innovation. There's competitors, we make a nutrient line. There's competitors in the space that say, formulated by scientists that have done this and that. Uh, one of my favorites is formulated by NASA scientists. That is absolutely true in 1970. So there hasn't been innovation in certain areas, and there are great opportunities for innovation in this market. And there's great opportunities in this market, and I'll talk about where it translates into ag. I think you heard a lot about more on the, the product side of this. I'm gonna talk a little bit more on the agricultural side, on the cultivation side, on the retail component. Retail, we're talking about hydroponic stores, we're talking about big box in certain cases, but 
We sell our products into the retail markets. We sell our products and our services into the commercial market. We're management partners. We're one of the supplier. We do JVs and management on seas of green, if you will. Mentioned the products we do. This was the first product line we offered. It's a nutrient line. We've subsequently got it in, gotten into uh, growing solutions. We're looking at irrigation. We're looking at a numerous uh, or a number of high tech areas, including plant data collection, including some AI components. A uh, project that I'm personally working on. There's interesting things going on in the agricultural market uh, in terms of controlling things like greenhouses and grow facilities and things like that. The industry overall hasn't taken that next step forward to what's happening in big ag. And I'll show you some of those folks. I'll just show you a slide at the end and kind of give you an idea who's, who's in the fringes of this and that isn't any of the companies you'd expect, and maybe a couple. Um, I, I want to point this out because when we talk about innovation, this is a really good point because people see this. And we have someone in the room who knows this very We have a couple people who know this. We have a grower in the room who knows this very well, who's a large, uh, uh, a large producer. When we think about innovation, we think about infrastructure. This is, to the untrained eye, a pot. It is, in fact, something which the county of Monterey likes so much they want to implement the state of California is interested in doing. What we do is 100% water recapture, 100% recycling, no nitrates in the soil, no water losses. We're thinking about, for guys that currently grow plants and they overspray, if you go to containment systems, you save 25%. If you go to recapture systems, you save 50%. This industry is going to change the landscape of agriculture. It'll change the landscape of cannabis. And I, I don't know what you guys do indoors. You probably recapture as it is. But a lot of the outdoor guys, they don't. It's very wasteful. The, we've already seen this coming in agriculture anywhere under glass in California. We are not going to be able to waste water. It's not going into drainage ditches. It's going to recapture environments. And, and we're leveraging that to create some of that, that, that technology today, but we see that coming down the pipe, and it'll evolve from here. I mean, we, we, we're, we can't work fast enough when we walk into an environment and we say, what are your pain points, and build things fast enough. The challenge for us is resources at this point. When I talk about just the, one of our product areas, this, we started in March of 2015 on one of the products. We've tripled every year, one product just to give you guys kind of an idea of how you do get profitable in the space and how you do make money. It's about that laser-like focus that Adrian mentioned. But it's also, this is the market. This market is growing so fast. There's so much opportunity that if you have considerations, there are a lot of challenges, but the reality is, is that this is the peripheral space. This is the supply side of the business. Love this business. Do this all day long. In a lot of ways, you know, I'm an Internet 1.0 guy. That IBM thing, I was there at the beginning. We're seeing some of those same, this is broadband, it's the internet, it's other things that have grown very fast. Um, and it has, you know, we talk about those risk adjusted returns. Yeah, we're looking at double digit growth rates in the market and we're looking at barriers to entry, whether they're federal, whether they're, you know, it goes with the state lines, whether it's the banking issue, whether it's the appetite, it's creating risk aversion, which is creating opportunities. And the other part of that, and the part that I get excited about is there's an enormous amount of information asymmetry. Um, and I won't go back to it, but that company Origin Capital is now Origin Investments that I started. It's a, uh, I'm out, it's not all glorious. It's about a half billion dollar fund at this point, or half, yeah, about half billion dollars at this point. Um, that was information asymmetry at its best. That was in the real estate market. This is the exact same case. There is, there are arbitrage opportunities because there is not availability or access to information, which is vital to any healthy market. Um, the other side of our business is about operational design. It's about effectively JVs on management, and I'll talk about a little bit more about that. There are lots of people in this space, and it's a very different business model than, than Candescence, I believe, which folks, folks under glass, folks with certain types of facilities that want to pursue <laughs> lower cost production, some of it commodity, so it's an area where we differ, um, a good portion of the commodity. I personally don't believe that every aspect of this will be 100% branded flower. I, I think that is a great niche. I think there's going to be a lot of commodity product that's going into consumables, that's going into non-metal tool use, that'll go into your vape pens. And those of you that raised your hand said you tried it. You know, um, you know, you might love your wine, you might like your beer, you don't care where the alcohol came from under the hood to a certain extent. You care about the brand. Uh, and we are big believers in this low-cost production 
That is, if you can't, you can't tell in the picture, that is about 70,000 square feet of weed, um, which is next to another 300,000 square feet uh, of weed, and that is California. Um, and when we see what's happening, late 2015, we just had too much pressure on, people came to us and said, we don't know the business model, we don't understand best practices. My consultant com consulting company that I started did management consulting for nearly 20 years. Uh, full disclosure, I stayed in too long. That's my one bad exit. Um, but what we saw was the emergence of good partners, people in, in the agricultural space that wanted to get into the market, and they're looking for good partners. So this is a key part of our business, which is partnering with folks, and you'll see this growth. Um, we'll get to here. We're at about a half million square feet of projects we currently work, work on. There's a million behind it. These ones here are already in the pipeline. Uh, we're looking at about, by the end of the year, this is really what's currently under licensing, which is about five million square feet. That's all in California, a little bit in Nevada, but most of it's in California. Um, and that is, that is projects we expect to emerge in 2018 as the state moves forward. So we expect supply to go up substantially. We expect the market to change. When I say I th expect price to go down, because I know how much this is. Um, and we are not the only one doing this. There's MedMen in this space, there's numerous others. Harborside has their own facilities. A lot of the companies you know. Um, there'll be substantial growth, and that's just one business. That's just us. So we're going to see enormous amounts of product moving into the space. Um, the other side of this, and I don't think uh, you mentioned this, um, this is the market, this is the latest data from ArcView and BDS. I mentioned the data's not perfect. The market may be twice as big as this when we look at the black market. Um, might be a little larger. This is the national market. For everybody in this room, is everybody here from California? Anybody from out of state? Okay, a couple? That's California, basically. I mean, California dominates the market. I, I, I don't know the exact breakdown off the top of my head at the moment, but 86? Yeah, okay. So it's California. California matters here, and until the federal law changes, it's going to matter more than anything. Uh, and it's this growing, um, it's this continuing grow, uh, uh, this continuously growing market. Um, for those of you who can't see, uh, this is the medical component, which I do agree 100%. The market's going to bifurcate. It has to. It's going to bifurcate, and we'll have adult use be this, this other realm, but continuing to grow. 24% uh, per annum, we will be, you know, over 10, bil 10 billion next year, and most of that will be here, seven, eight billion here is the, is the number. Um, so this is, the only thing that's grown faster recently was uh, broadband. I uh, saw that data point, and I believe that's, in fact, to be true. Why does this matter? Um, it's because if we think about, and I'm going to switch gears a little bit, just talk about ag. You, this is what you make when you grow agriculture. Um, and I'm, I'm going to defer to Adrian here as the expert on indoor. I'm not talking about indoor. I'm talking about outside. You can grow hops for $4 a square foot. That's about what you get on your land. Cannabis at the moment in the national spot price is right around 60 There is nothing like this in the ground. There hasn't been anything like this in the ground ever, uh, at least to my knowledge. Um, anybody here has better data on that? Tell me what you're growing. Maybe poppies, but we can't grow those either. Um, so that is really this massive driver. That's, you know, national spot price, about 1500 a pound. If you're treating it as ag and you're watching your numbers and you're controlling your costs, you're going to make money. It pencils out. That's, I'm not suggesting everyone here go buy a farm. There's issues with that, but this is a big driver for this market. Um, one thing that I, I want to touch on, too, is, you know, and it gets... It gets to the, the, the national appetite. We're at about 60%. Um, I do think that some of the challenges we face will get pushed down by the fact that even in places with, uh, with red governors, there's not an appetite for change. We continue to trend upward. I like these long-term trend lines. It's data I trust. We're, we're going, uh, it probably is 50 years. We're there. We're at the tipping point where we don't go backwards, in my opinion, and, and the opinion of a lot of my colleagues. Um, Two areas of concern, and, and, and this has already been touched on, but I'll give you my perspective on this. Um, I think 
the AG had comments today. He's, he's not going to go backwards on this. I do think that we'll see in the gray and black market, and we see signs of this already, and there's, his, there's historical precedent to believe in this. When prohibition died, we saw enforcement step up tremendously. Uh, we see, we see uh, uh, the seizure of assets on the increase when opportunities seem to drop in certain areas. So I would expect we'll see the black and gray markets consumed by the appetite of local law enforcement and whatever willingness there is on the, part, on the, uh, uh, on the DOJ to support that in whatever way they can. But I think it's, in my view, it's going to attack the market that we want to exit more than the market that we want to keep. Um, in, in, and from a legislative perspective, they don't have an appetite whatsoever. The other part of it is, is banking's still a problem. Banking's still an issue. There are 300 banks, maybe, maybe 350 at this point, but it still chills the industry. It chill, still creates too much cash floating around. The IRS doesn't want it because people are walking into their offices with money counters and bags of cash. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily hold up the market as much as other factors. Um, and someone asked, someone asked me this earlier before I, I got up. They said, you know, is banking locking up the market? I don't believe banking's locking up the market. The market's still occurring. What's probably chilling capital more than that is the number of folks that still can't pass muster on, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the quality of those teams. I think there's some great folks up here and I think the folks in, the, in this room that understand that quality of the team argument, right? Uh, it's the jockey, as someone put it to me. There's a lot of folks where you can't get past the IRS and their felonies before you have a good team in front of you and an opportunity to invest capital. So if you are thinking about, if you're investors in the room, you're looking at projects, it's the team, it's the team, it's the team. It's what we see over and over again. Full disclosure, we've walked away from projects. We've walked away from customers because there's just, to use the technical term, there's too much hair on them. Um, uh, uh, now, Steve asked me, he said, you know, one thing I want you to touch on is where is the business headed? The answer to that question is, I don't know, but I'm going to predict it for you. Um, and uh, uh, full I had coffee this morning with my father-in-law, and he said, I got one bit of advice for you. I said, what's that? He said, don't say anything stupid. So I'll try not to do that at the moment, but I'm going to, I'm going to, so don't hold me to these predictions. Um, you know, the cannabis industry, every, every, everything we see points to exponential growth. Um, we think the, at least the federal from my point of view, the federal laws are going to stay the way they are for at least three years, probably more like five. So we see those barriers staying up, high barriers to entry across state lines. That's good for prices. It's good for the industry from one point of view. It'll, it'll put a cap on the total number. I mean, we're talking about $25 billion in less than five years. It's probably two to three times, maybe four times that if the federal government changes their mind. And some folks at the data services believe that to be the case. Um, Brand development, uh, you know, he may be the smartest guy in the room because the branding, he was the first one to hit on it, and I think that's really going to be key for a lot of folks, particularly for end product. Um, these branding efforts are going to be enormous. From my point of view, and more of the commodity side of the business, post-production, testing are going to be vital, making sure you have decent product, knowing that extracts, consumables, again, I'm trending more towards adult use than medical, that post-production and the markets that make those and the people that create those businesses will be very interesting and really opportunistic. Um, I think, I'm gonna skip over this one and come back to it, but the idea of very aggressive capital, there's several funds in the range of 100 to $250 million now available. They're doing debt-based financing. Their rates are in the 12-ish range. So continue to see, as long as we don't have traditional access to capital, it's gonna be a great market for people making uh, debt-based businesses. And obviously equity comes at a massive premium. Uh, you know, you're seeing risk-adjusted numbers in the 40-50% range, even for mature businesses, for those of you that are uh, on the investment side. The caveat to that is somebody's going to be clever enough to break this banking seal in some way. Somebody's going to come up with something. The banks are going to say, help us. So it's, and I would suspect within 12 months we see it because the, as quickly as it's growing and as much cash is floating around, we'll start to see either the appetite change or something bad enough happen to get people's attention. It become politically inconvenient for them to keep doing this. The other thing I'll see, and I, you'll see this on both sides, M&A um, is happening. m and is accelerating in this space. Companies are getting rolled up. Some of the big guys are coming in. Uh, 
We've certainly looked at some opportunities ourselves, uh, and we will see more and more of that in this space. And yeah, um, I would expect that to, it, the activity at least double. Go. Got it. Thanks. Um, last point, just talk on the picks and shovels piece. All the same. Um, we'll continue to see innovation and the like. And then uh, the one piece I'd add to this, and I'll finish up, is uh, the ag component. Um, for those of you interested in anything related to this market, the ag piece is going to be important. These are companies you don't normally see associated with cannabis. And they all have interest or are working on projects related to either innovation or technology in the space. A couple I'll point out. Google, that's IBM Watson. Scott's is obviously buying up people like crazy. And this is a traditional ag company. Works with all the farms around here. So I just wanted to highlight that component. The big guys are already here. If you're wondering, they're in the, safe. They're in the space. We're talking to them. Thank you all for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. That was terrific. Paul, come on up. And uh, Paul's going to give us more of a local perspective. Good evening, everybody. You still here? All right. My name's Paul Kowalski. And I'm here representing the Cannabis Business Council of Santa Barbara County. We are a group of local business people who volunteer our time to work on education and advocacy for the cannabis industry. The Business Council was formed to encourage and support the education and advocacy for smart cannabis policies. We work toward and we are committed to smart and fair regulations that promote public safety, economic development, and compliance with the law. Our mission is education and advocacy. We work with policymakers developing industry regulations, and we've been working recently with the Santa Barbara County Supervisors. The way that it's working now is the county is trying to develop regulations at the same time they wait for the state to develop regulations and pass them down. So we support collaboration where the business community and the politicians are able to work on something that's going to make sense. We're encouraging economic development, giving cannabis farmers a stronger voice in the conversation. Uh, additionally, we're supporting partnerships with California's public universities that will allow Santa Barbara County to participate in scientific research and breakthroughs in the cannabis industry, using cannabis to treat different diseases. All right, so... That's why I'm here. I'm here to talk about education and advocacy. Um, I'm not sure I can cover 20 years of a $2.7 billion industry in 15 minutes. So what I'm going to do is just kind of give you a high-level perspective from my point of view. Um, I've been working in the industry for about 12 years. I currently manage a medical marijuana collective. We have more than two. 3,000 Santa Barbara County members. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly talk about the past, the present, and the future of the industry, keeping in mind that there are a lot of perspectives that I probably can't represent here. All right. So the past consists of a number of things. Normal was founded in 1970. They thought it was going to be a three to seven year stint and they were going to be able to make sensible legislation. Well, that was 47 years ago. Uh, and so I'm bringing some of this past to give you the perspective that we currently have the present and then we're going to have the future. And you need to consider what is out there. The past was comprised of many people who have been doing things for a long time. Humboldt County takes great pride in, actually, takes 
great pride in um, the fact that they've been growing cannabis, and they say they grow the best cannabis in the state of California. You know, so, so there's a lot of that out there. Uh, the California voters passed Prop 215 21 years ago. And 21 years ago, people who got into the industry, in many instances, it was a personal reason. There was a concern for patients. They knew somebody who was ill, they were ill, and there weren't a lot of alternatives out there. So a lot of people who have gotten into the industry in the past are very committed to their cause. Um, in December, we had five of our members, friends, uh, lose their battle with cancer. You know, we've lost five people that we've come to care about. Uh, fortunately, we haven't lost anybody since then. But December was a bad month for us. Uh, the industry consists of small and very small businesses. There was no banking, there was no financing, and literally 20 years of persecution and prosecution. That's pretty much what the industry has been like. Again, it's not for everybody, but for many, many people, it was a bad time. And yet they came back. They did their fight and they came back. So presently, it's an industry of very rapid change. Um, we have family farmers. People who have been farmers for a long time are now adding cannabis as to one of the crops that they're growing. And as you, so part of the reason that's important is because they have very large facilities that they've been operating for years and they're now coming into this market segment. Okay. Um, one of the things that has changed, when I got into this industry, edibles were basically Rice Krispie treats or brownies they were wrapped in plastic or Ziploc bags. There was a 4X system, which meant if there were four X's on it, it was really strong. You should only eat one quarter of it. Um, and we've come a long way since then. There's, the present is, I think, indicative of what the future is going to hold. There's a lot of influx of capital. There's a lot of opportunism. There's a lot of opportunity. There is skepticism. Uh, there are going to be huge capacity and production increases, as some of the people pointed out with better charts. Wholesale prices have been plummeting for five or ten years. Uh, I don't foresee any slowdown in the falling of prices as additional capacity comes online. A lot of regulations are going to be developed, and a lot of new products and categories are going to be developed. All right. Again, the future, the current is a lot like the future. We're coming into a time where the industry's been around for 20 years, and people, thousands of companies are going to be innovating because they've been around this for a long time. The introduction of big money and big business is going to bring a lot of uh, expertise as well as resources to bear on the industry. It's going to become highly regulated and highly taxed. The government seems to think that there's a whole lot of uh, money in there, even though I don't really believe there is. And as you pointed out, Adrian, it's going to be years from investments made now before you actually see any kind of profit. Historically, we've operated as a not-for-profit mutual benefit corporation, so there wasn't profits ever to be had. Most of the money was put back into the business because financing wasn't available. It's tough to make payroll, uh, all of that kind of stuff. So as the taxes come and the bigger businesses come in, there's going to be greater barriers to entry and increases in size and the economies of scale, where right now, Five or 10,000 square feet indoor can be a huge grow. We're talking 160 more thousand feet you're adding. So, you know, these are, these are big changes from what we've seen historically. And I think that the future is going to be exciting for everybody. There are differences between uh, adult use and medical use. I would like to see a lot more scientific research into the medical area. I think adult use is pretty much going to take care of itself. Um, 
a lot of what I'm telling you isn't necessarily from opinion. It's from information I've gathered from other resources. And so there, here's, here's two takes on it. Um, in August of last year, Politico wrote an article about how big alcohol is about to get rich off of California weed. And this is where they talk about distribution. And then there's a company, we are fortunate to have Max here, but uh, just yesterday, Greenflower Media had announced a live stream uh, video tomorrow on how small cannabis farms can make it big in today's market. So it's going to be a big marketplace. There's going to be big players, there's going to be small players. I think that um, the only thing I'm confident in predicting is that both big businesses and small businesses will succeed and they will fail in this industry. And that's about all I'm confident in predicting. So I, I could talk for hours. What I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap it up and then uh, leave time for your, your questions and answers. Thank you, Paul. Those are some really terrific uh, insights that you shared with us. Um, it was a great intro to uh, next speaker, Max Simon from Green, Greenflower Media. Um, come on up and tell us about the education side of the business. Whew. All right, let's take a deep breath. It's been a lot of information dumped at you. I'm going to go a little more on the emotional side of things here, just to liven things up. So let me first start by just asking you a question. Why did you come here tonight? Throw out some answers. What, what is it you were interested in? Were you interested in the business? Were you interested in the medical side? Go ahead and share with me. Business, medical, competition. Uh -huh. Free samples. That's legal now. I didn't know if you know that, but um, to get high, right? <laughs> Education, yeah. So um, uh, they said my name is Max Simon. Um, I built Deepak Chopra's business. If anybody's familiar with Deepak, funny guy with glasses, um, taught a lot of you to meditate. And um, I share that with you because uh, does anybody remember the temperament of meditation in early 2000s? Anybody? Well, I do. Um, it was highly stigmatized. It was seen as something people only on the fringe did. It was not backed by any science yet. And what we knew was that this tool, this approach, this philosophy was actually inherently good for people. And so over the course of the work we did, broadcasting and creating media and creating um, strategies, we actually helped tens of millions of people to learn how to meditate. And now, I'm really proud that, how many of you here meditate? Right. Amazing, right? How many of you here go to yoga studios? Amazing. How many of you here consider yourselves kind of conscious, healthy individuals? Right. That was the movement that we really birthed in a much larger way to legitimize. And the thing that I see about cannabis is it is the exact same experience. The only difference is that cannabis is about a thousand times <clears throat> bigger. Because, here's the thing, if I was to teach you to meditate, it would take you 21 days to get that part of your mind that's telling you you're crazy to quiet down. If you take a one milligram tincture, you will calm down in about 15 minutes. <laughs> right? The effectiveness of cannabis for um, relief, happiness, enjoyment, creativity, inspiration, um, pain relief, sleep is so phenomenal. And if for anybody that's developed a relationship with this plant, you'll realize just what an unbel unbelievable time this is. So the cool thing for me is that you're watching the world wake up right now to cannabis. How do I know that? There's 200 of you in this room right now coming to listen because it's interesting and exciting. So the stats are that there's over 200 million cannabis users, at least reported cannabis users worldwide. In the United States now, 75 million Americans now have legal safe access in some kind of legal or medical arena. That is an unbelievable thing to realize that even just five years ago, seven years ago, we didn't even have the ability to get our hands on this plant in a way that we could trust or believe in. 
So right now, the world is waking up to cannabis. But to tell our story, I realized very quickly when I started to look into this space as an entrepreneur and as a professional, there was no place for anybody to go to get any trusted answers. You have all this excitement, enthusiasm, and nobody actually knows anything about how the plant works. We don't understand about how it interacts in the body. We don't understand how to grow it. We don't understand about the industry. There's questions that this ginormous global audience has that people simply weren't providing answers to. And so uh, we founded our company. We're only actually about a year and a half old now, but have quickly become the world's largest providers of credible cannabis education online. And specifically, what that means is that we have built the largest network of credible doctors, scientists, researchers, uh, thought leaders, entrepreneurs, investors that are on the front lines of cannabis. And we ultimately say to them, like these guys here, you have something of value to share. You have knowledge and wisdom that can not only help you, but help establish you as a thought leader in this space. So we partner with them and we help them create online classes, online courses, online videos, articles, um, online seminars, master classes. We have a, a, an abundance of different content that we essentially create using the thought leadership and expertise of the world's top experts. And I wanna really make it clear why cannabis as a subject and as an industry is so fascinating. Because when you look at it from the lens of verticals, which is what my content mind has been trained to do, you realize that there are four distinctly unique, separate individual verticals in this space that have the most rich, exciting, interesting data, topics, conversations that you've ever seen. So you have the health side, which I am gonna talk about a little bit today because it's simply too compelling to kind of wash over some of the understanding of how this plant works. But as you've heard from some of the statistics, and if you have anybody in your family who's ever been sick with like insomnia or pain or stress or depression or a lot of these inflammatory diseases, you will see that cannabis could potentially be the most effective treatment protocol to get them into a state of happiness and balance that exists today. But then you have the science side. You've heard people talking about you know, the ways that you extract the plant or the compounds in the plant, the cannabinoids, the terpenes, the extraction methods, the amount of, of scientific evolution that has the capacity in the space to unfold is just remarkable. Then you have this whole cannabis industry side, which is so complex and has so many different facets to it that you know, we and others create multi-day seminars and touch on 5% of the fraction of it. But you know, there's another part of this which um, we have become really infatuated with at Green Flower, which is what we call the DIY side. Like, did you know every person in this room could grow their own legal weed right now? Did you know that every one of you could grow your own plants legally? You could pop some in the ground in your backyard, and I mean, it wouldn't be very good, actually, it'd suck. But you can do it, and it's an amazing experience. Now, it's a massive learning curve, but to be able to grow your own, to be able to make your own edibles, make your own tinctures, make your own products, to create lotions and salves, to have your own cooking parties with friends, like, there is a whole world of opportunity for people to actually learn how to utilize this incredible plant. Now, I just started growing a few seasons ago. Um, it's an amazing thing. And I'll tell you, if anybody wants a really effing cool new hobby, decide to grow some pot this year. <laughs> so, you know, as an education company, we could probably spend the next uh, three months teaching you about all these different areas. But I want to highlight a few things that I think are most compelling and most interesting about cannabis and the cannabis plant and the cannabis industry because if there's one message I actually want you to leave with here, it's that while some of you or many of you or most of you might be looking at this as a um, cautiously interested observer, that actually for you as a patient or uh, somebody that is proactively involved in this space, there, there is such cool ways that this plant can improve the quality of your life and the lives of the people around you. So first, um, 
I can say from my background as being one of the people really on the pioneers of the evolution of mind-body medicine, that we will look back at the end of this century and say that cannabis was one of the single greatest advancements in health and well-being of the 21st century. And I can say that for one very specific reason. Does anybody know what it is? Take a guess. It's a little discovery that happened in the 90s by some scientists. Anybody? The endocannabinoid system. So I'm going to just briefly, because it's a very complex subject, but touch on the um, brilliance of what has been discovered. So um, when we were trying to understand why cannabis gets you high, some scientists were looking at the pathways of what happens with THC in the body, and basically what they uncovered is that throughout your entire physiology, your brain, all of your immune uh, your organs, around your immune system, around your, many of your fascia tissue, around your GI tract, there is this unbelievably dense receptor network called the endocannabinoid system. And the, while it's way more complicated than this, the essential function of the endocannabinoid system is to create a homeostatic environment. So that means, if you were to think of it really simply, if you're not sleeping, the endocannabinoid system would say, well, that is a regulatory framework for us to bring back into a state of balance so that you sleep. If you're having excessive inflammation and pain, that's an overexertion of your endocannabinoid system, and if we regulate it with the right cannabinoids, it brings you back into a state of balance. Now, the reason why this system is so important is because it exists everywhere. It exists in your brain. It exists in all these different places in the body. And so what the medical community that's into cannabis and the scientific community that's into cannabis is so excited about is they're realizing that things like migraines or migratory headaches are really an endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. Your, your parts of your brain are not producing enough cannabinoids. Because what people don't realize is that from the day you're born, your body is actually producing its own endogenous cannabinoids. But when you are not then producing enough, this endocannabinoid system becomes deficient or overexerted, stops working as effectively, and that's when people get sick and have chronic issues. Well, just by luck, by pure magic, by God's intervention, this plant, the cannabinoid, has, this cannabis plant, has the most dense, rich source of cannabinoids in existence. So when we supplement with this phytocannabinoid from a plant, we supplement our body's natural endocannabinoid system, that's what causes us to come back into a state of balance. And what so many of the illnesses that we face today are being tied to this endocannabinoid deficiency. So as science catches up to some of the analogies and anecdotal evidence, as well as some of the early clinical stuff that's been happening in places around the world, I feel pretty strongly based upon the fact that we're interacting with over 75,000 cannabis patients around the country, that we will validate very clearly that cannabis is not only a medicine, but is a medicine for things like everyday depression and anxiety. It's a symptom for things like sleep. It's a symptom for things like weight loss. It's a symptom for things like appetite. Um, I have been a cannabis consumer since I was 13 years old, not realizing that uh, my ADHD, which has plagued me my, my entire life, has been without a question better treated from cannabis than any other pharmaceutical in existence today. Right? So this discovery of the endocannabinoid system, the science that's evolving to uh, show us what's possible with it, and the clinical studies that are happening oftentimes privately now. Most people don't realize there's a ton of research happening. We'll validate just how profound this discovery is. And the crazy thing, by the way, is that the endocannabinoid system isn't even mentioned in medical school yet. Right? It just goes to show you how far we have to go in terms of education because people can go through an entire medical training and not even have this word mentioned to them within their entire clinical, tri or, uh, clinical application. Now, I also want to be clear, if you've noticed, when anybody ever thinks about cannabis or pot or marijuana, what is the image that we see? We see people smoking joints, right? Even in that beautifully produced video, which, I mean, you know, I love smoking joints, but the point is that the growth of this industry and for where so many people will engage has nothing to do with smoke. It has to do with topicals you put under your tongue under precise doses. It has to do with a drink that you drink that tastes nothing like it. 
It has to do with these little gel caps that you can pop just like nutraceuticals, right? There is an abundance of new delivery methods that are coming into the scene every week, seemingly, that have nothing to do with smoking. And what that does is it allows it to be in nursing homes, to be taken as a tincture for elderly population. It can be administered to very sick kids that have certain things like cancers or epilepsies that actually would be better treated with some of these natural medicines. And it also has to do with changing the stigma of it. Because I can tell you, as somebody on the front lines of educating the world, the biggest obstacle that we face in cannabis is not necessarily all the crazy regulation, all this other stuff. It's that people still think it's just about getting high and smoking pot and smoking joints. And it is so far evolved beyond that now that we want everybody to catch up. And the other thing to realize is that you can not get high at all. I don't know if people realize this, but you can get a, an abundance of the benefits of cannabis without changing your state of mind at all. Whether that's CBD-rich medications, whether that's titrating the amount of THC you consume, whether that's creating balance ratios of cannabinoids, whether that's doing things that uh, combat some of the psychoactivity, there is a plethora of ways that we can engage with this plant that will allow people every day of their lives to gain the benefits without the fears and risks of getting a little stoned. Now, I also want to say, and as I said this before, but there's also an amazing opportunity, which is to realize that there will be five to 10 million home growers within the next few years. So I will want to emphasize some of the market stuff there in terms of if you're an investor or if you're thinking about this as a business opportunity, both on the side of being cultivators, which is a little trickier to get into, but definitely on the side of serving this audience. There is an enormous population of people that are coming online that either don't know nearly as much as they'd like to or know a lot and are looking for better things and are gonna need services products, financing to uh, support this massive, enormous kind of niche population within the industry. Um, you know, it's also just important to note that this industry, and it's true, I did recently see that broadband is actually still growing faster than cannabis, but it's an innovation and creativity hotbed right now. And so for the people that like to create something new, whether that's from an engineering perspective or an entrepreneurial perspective, I would strongly suggest looking into cannabis because everything that you would want to create exists in this space has been said before, from the technology side to the software side to the media side to the services side to the finance side. I mean, it is just, it feels very resemblant to what the dot-com boom was like, um, except for this one is got a little bit more complications being that it's still federally illegal. And here's the cool thing though, if you look at some of the stats, um, some recent reports came out that there will be 120,000 new jobs created in the next three years, that there will be 20,000 new businesses birthed, and that it will reach $21 billion in new revenue. I mean, it's just kind of exciting when you hear those kind of numbers and think that there's an opportunity to play a role in it. So, a few suggestions for you before we uh, head to the panels here. One, um, please be willing to get educated. And this is a great example of that. The seminars are a great example of that. Of course, we would love for you to uh, take advantage of our green flower site because we have an abundance of stuff. But one of the things you'll find, and seriously, no pun intended, but it's super sticky. Cannabis as a topic will just hook you in. And all of a sudden, and this is the thing I say, it only takes one of your family members getting sick and realizing that it's very likely, whether it's just simple relief or it's actually got some curative properties by nature, cannabis will, should be a potential solution for you to really look into and understand. And what I believe is that all this governmental regulation nonsense that seems literally so nonsensical sometimes is based upon a lack of understanding of the truth. So if we as a population get educated about the realities of the safety profile, the opportunities, the medical efficacy of this plant, we as a community can kind of combat the ignorance that exists really prominently that hurts people that are touching the plant. Secondly, I really encourage you, like, you know, I, 
I have a love-hate relationship whenever I even see Cheech and Chong in anything, <laughs> because it subconsciously just still re-embraces the stigma, right? It still makes us think this is what it is, and I do it too, right? It's really easy for me to call people stoners, but I'm a stoner, right? But I don't look anything like what a stoner is. Guess what? My 96-year-old grandpa is now a stoner. My 64-year-old mother is now a stoner, right? My stepmom who's dealing with depression is now a stoner. We have to embrace that despite the stigma and the propaganda and the funny comedies that exist, this is so much bigger than that now. And every person in this room actually could benefit from utilizing this plant if we can drop the kind of shame that so many of us still feel. Um, and I really want to encourage you because, you know, I, I have a health and wellness background, particularly a holistic background, and um, it's hard being a human. <laughs> you know what I mean? We, we all suffer from a lot of different stuff, whether that's we don't sleep, whether that's we have pain, whether that's we feel insignificant in the world, whether that's we feel like we're not making enough uh, strides in our purpose, whether we're lose, uh, feeling a lack of love in our lives, whether we're just not happy. And the truth is, used responsibly, used mindfully with the right education and the right products, cannabis is a game changer. It is an absolute life-changing game changer for people. And when we can put down the stigma and be willing to look at it, I think you'll find and be surprised by just how much value it can provide to your life and the people's lives all around you. So, um, of course, I have to do a little plug because we're an education company. And I want you to know that one of the cool things we do is that we have the world's largest library of cannabis classes in the health side, in the uh, industry side, in the science side. We even have a whole slew of classes about cannabis for yoga and cannabis and fitness. Um, and basically everything you'd ever want to learn. And the cool thing about it is that we've decided to make it accessible to everyone for just a small monthly fee, like a Netflix model. And so it opens this education up to the entire world. And the cool thing is that um, in about a week from now, we have a promotion expiring where we would also gift you with the entire Cannabis Health Summit, which is like the TED Talks of cannabis. So I would encourage you just to write this URL down and go check it out when you get home because if you're interested in learning more about what this is, this is a pretty uh, perfect opportunity to kind of dive in and get educated. So it's learngreenflower.com forward slash insider. And I'll just leave you with this. You know, um, changing a collective consciousness's story is not easy. I've been very much through that path with meditation and yoga. I mean, I, I remember when I got totally bitched out by a certain group I will leave unnamed that saying that yoga was worshiping the devil. And, and it's taken a while for us to understand that this is non-threatening. But the reason why it changes is people like you changing the story in your own mind first. And so I really hope that through what we've shared with you here today and maybe some of the things that you'll learn with us, you've taken a step forward in starting to change the story in your own mind about what cannabis is and what its potential is. Because if we do that, the progress and growth that we'll experience on a regulatory side, a health side, a science side, an industry side will uh, accelerate rapidly. And the only reason we're not experiencing that is ignorance. So thank you guys for being here. Wow, thank you, Max. And uh, I want to thank you guys. Um, this is pretty amazing. The house is still just about completely full. So that is a real testament to our, our speakers. It's a testament to you guys and the topic. We have time for some Q&A. There are at least two microphones roving around. And generally what I'm going to do is I'm going to alternate between the left side and the right side. I'm going to trust my roving mics to pick people out. So hold up your hand. And Doug, why don't you grab, pick the first person? <clears throat> Hi, thank you for all coming down here. Um, I'm a finance guy, so that's why I have a tie. So sorry <laughs> about that. Uh, <laughs> so my question is about finance. Um, I would like to ask everyone uh, on the panel to talk about what you guys think is the most promising technology in, in the financial services space that will truly solve the problem of the federal banking charter, of FinCEN reporting, of the enhanced monitoring and 
and, and, and reporting that has to be followed. And, and not workarounds, uh, a true solution to the problem that even state regular, regular, uh, regulators would embrace, federal regulators. Great, why don't we, uh, let's see, Adrian, you want to take that question first? Sure, am I mic'd? Uh, candidly, I, if you're looking for a technology, I think it'd be like investing in the horse and buggy industry in 1904. The reason I say that is, I think to the points that were made, the momentum this industry is gaining with the collective consciousness uh, in terms of how do you solve the banking problem, that's going to go away, in my opinion, at some point, And I think it's going to be easily in the next eight, eight years, if not sooner. The industry is going to be banked. We're not going to need workarounds. We're just going to, I mean, there's hundreds of us who already have banking relationships, and that's individual branch owners starting up for the collective consciousness uh, and getting comfortable. So there's going to be a lot of financial platforms, but my own opinion is if you're looking for the magic bullet to solve the banking crisis, uh, I think that's investing in a dying technology because it won't be here to last. It will just be participants in the regular mainstream banking system. No, I, I, would, I would agree with that. I mean, I think uh, a, a point that I glossed over very quickly is I think banking gets so solved sooner. Uh, I think one of the riskier guys in the, in the large bank, uh, Jamie Dimon, right? He's a guy who's got an appetite for taking up bites. One of those guys will step forward and finally say, on behalf of uh, Scott's, right? Jim Hagedorn spending a half billion dollars in this industry, the CEO of Scott's. He's bought up a bunch of companies already. He's bankable. They pressure, their boards get involved. I, I think we'll see a combination of economic and political pressure, and I, I agree with Adrian pretty dramatically. It's not going to be tech. It's not going to be Bitcoin. It'll be, it'll be, it'll be Chase or one of those guys. It'll, it, you know, it'll be a national that comes in and says, here's the coalition. They'll go forward and they'll say, we have to, we have to solve this problem because we're creating more risk than we are solutions. So maybe Citibank or JP Morgan Chase will step up and say, all right, we're just going to do this now. All right, Violet, do you want to have, all right. Uh, hi, thank you all for uh, your talks. It was very informative. Um, so I have a question uh, mostly for Michael and Adrian, but uh, feel free. Um, you two brought up um, the, the bifurcation between the medical and the adult use industry uh, going forward in the future. Um, how do you think that would play out in terms of regulations and access and things like that? Because it's not like the alcohol industry has to do clinical trials or um, things like that, right? So it's not quite a fair comparison, um, but how do you see that going forward? I, I left my crystal ball at home. Uh, Did you bring well, this? I, I mean, I, I actually, I'll, I'll refer to something Max said when he talked about, you know, one milligram pills. Um, and I'm not ducking the question, but I think where we'll see two things. What Adrian said, you know, we're going to have to see a dramatically higher level of control. Uh, not higher testing, but better control. When you walk into a nursing home, uh, walking with a medical professional who's taking someone off an opioid and replacing that, uh, you know, late in life, the elder care facility. Um, they need tightly titrated dosages, and they need to understand how those dosages are going to work on each individual patient. Um, anybody here who's done an edible, every one of us can take the same edible and we'll have a completely different experience. In the medical community, I think the answer to your question is, is going to have to get down to these very small dosages, have it very well controlled, have it very tightly isolated. So when you do something and you're involving 100 compounds or 150 or 200 with some strains, as an adult, knock yourself out. As a patient, where you might want to have more narrow control, I think that's going to be the other piece of it, is saying we're going to parse out these components because it has a negative impact. Um, so I think two things. It'll be, it'll be uh, uh, ultra pure dosing and it'll be level of control on the compounds underneath. That, that's where I see a big aspect or a big component of the change at least on the product side. I, I totally agree. Um, the thing I would emphasize is there's really not going to be right answers. I mean, the C agree model is I be, I'm a deep believer you can have the biggest grow on the planet if you're extracting it, because that's not a connoisseur's product. Yeah. My product, I serve high-end adult use smokers who enjoy flavor, taste, and they want the whole enchilada, if you will. And if you ask my opinion, the pharmaceutical industry 
will absolutely have targeted dosage levels. But there's already a growing whole plant theory in the industry that they call it the entourage effect, that you need the full plant and all the cannabinoids because they reinforce each other. Is that proven? No, not yet, but I certainly believe there'll be highly targeted doses. I mean, in the case of children with epilepsy, absolutely, there should not be a psychoactive component of that, and we should strip it out and uh, give it in highly targeted doses. I think just as much as that medical industry is going to take off with hardcore clinical trials, I think you'll have another side of the industry, which is, you know, there was a book written in, I think it was the 1800s, called The Alcoholic Republic. And I, I, my thesis is, you know, hu human beings look to alter their state of mind. That's why I'm on the high-end adult use side. There's no one way. It's just going to get highly targeted in certain markets. And I think, you know, we're in the whole foods business for people who want to experience the plant. There's no right answer. You know, and one thing I would add to that, um, you, you said something that I think is, is important and worth riffing off, if you will, which is this will not be a straight line. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we all suspect that, but, but the punchline that really should be said is this, there's an enormous amount of anecdotal information pointing us in the direction that says there's benefit here, there's benefit here, there's benefit there. We're going to have bad, we're going to have bad outcomes too. We're going to have some things, we, we get bad information. It was a study that came out uh, about a year ago that said that serial abuse in some people creates psychosis, right? Um, so we, we have to anticipate there's going to be those bad outcomes and we'll make some big changes. Um, not in every case, but, you know, like I said, it's a crystal ball question to a certain extent, but it absolutely will not be a straight line. That's the one thing I would guarantee. Max, what's your perspective? I mean, the hard part about this is that the uncertainty of the regulatory environment is going to create a lot of the answers. So if it, you know, to, I don't remember who said it, but to the point of staying on Schedule 1 being a good thing, there's some real truth to that, because if it goes to Schedule 2, let's say, for example, and now it has to go, now that transfers it to the FDA. Well, now that screws the whole system up currently because all the, the ways that the current landscape are putting themselves through it can't happen anymore. It's a different regulatory testing environment, a different um, rollout plan for the medicines. And so, you know, unfortunately, nobody knows if it'll stay on Schedule 1, if it'll go to Schedule 2, if it'll get descheduled. What we do know is that states specifically are fighting really hard to try to figure it out individually. And California right now is actually leading the charge in terms of this delineation between proper regulation for medical and proper regulation for adult use. And so I think if we can have any indication of what we hope it will be, Actually, what's happening right here is the best of these two kind of governing bodies, both being approved and regulated and put in place, except for even in those spaces, there's still just a god-awful amount of uncertainty of how it's going to unfold. All right. I think we have time for one more question. But So what I'll say is I think our panelists will stay up here a little bit longer, so we'll have one more question. I'm going to shut it down. We'll, we'll call it a night, but the, the panelists will stay for a little bit longer if you guys have follow-up questions that you want to direct. And I think the microphone is... Right here. Um, it, it does. Do you have any expectations of a public market in the U.S. in the near future? Uh, for any of these companies? No, uh, not necessarily for your company. Paul, but just, why don't you know. take that question? So, do you do you see the an opportunity? Like, is you're saying a public market, like a uh, public traded, publicly traded companies, or okay, publicly traded companies in in the cannabis business? Yeah, that's a tough one. I, I think as long as the federal government has it as a Schedule One and is opposed to it, you're not going to see any nationwide companies. I mean, California is going to do what it does, but as far as uh, public companies and uh, on the nationwide level, I think it's a long way away. I mean, I think it's important to separate, though, the plant-touching companies and non-plant-touching companies. Right, plant-touching companies, hell no. They're, that's That'll be impossible, I think, for the foreseeable future. Um, non-plant-touching companies, absolutely. I think you'll see more tech companies, media companies, um, ag, uh, you know, ancillary business companies. Elite Garden. Yeah, there's there, there are plenty that are um, gaining traction in different funny ways. I mean, even a friend of mine that runs Mass Roots, they got 
rejected by the NASDAQ, but at least they were considered. <laughs> and that's a step forward. So you'll see it, but um, it, it's just plant touching and non-plant touching are very different landscapes. All right. Well, I, I think... Sure. Um, so, um, Michael? Well, I would, I would, uh, there's one point I would add, which is that uh, uh, a friend of mine sits on the board of a, uh, a commodities exchange. And uh, he and his colleagues have started to develop a hemp exchange as hemp has become a legal product. Um, and I did have a phone call with him, and I basically said, you know, uh, he he, this is a guy who retired, went back to work. His wife said, I don't want to see you at home so much, so this is what he's doing. And I said, hey, uh, I said, so when are you doing weed? And I hurriedly heard him, heard him pick up the phone. And I said, when are you going to do, you know, do a cannabis exchange? And he took me off speaker and he said, well, we're not. And I said, come on. He said, well, we're trying to figure that out. So the commodities markets um, or the folks that are trading these financial securities are certainly looking at, and my understanding is there's multiples now, looking at understanding how they can provide financial products. So that would be, in my mind, I mean, Max is right, That'll probably be the first kind of thing we see, which is guys selling futures and, and options on, on cannabis production. But that's, you know, that's a swag. But I think that's probably the first one we'd see. Uh, I'll answer it in a couple of ways. First, the delineation between do you touch the plant or not is paramount. So absolutely, I mean, hey, if look at what Scott's miracle Grow is doing. They're publicly traded, I believe. I mean, they're snapping up assets quickly in the space. So if you're looking for a derivative play to the space, kind of a pickaxe and shovel, and we'll see where their long-term intentions are, uh, you know, those trades are there to have. For In terms of touching the plant, uh, I don't think we're going to see publicly traded companies in the next three, four years. Uh, but I can already tell you, my company has been... Uh, approach multiple times by guys who run pink sheets trades and want to take us out and do a pipe. Uh, you know, I personally would never touch that because it's, it's icky. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, most of the guys on the pink sheets, there's a reason they're on the pink sheets. Uh, but, you know, if I, if I were to say, is it going to happen? You know, I'll do my best Gordon Gecko. Greed is good. Okay? okay. Why am I saying well, that? It's publicly <laughs> traded in Canada. It's publicly traded in other countries. If you think the powers that be on Wall Street are going to yeah, cede yeah. this product to foreign exchanges long term, uh uh. So the collective pressure, I think, will ultimately force, just like the banks, a chase will step up and say, hey, we're banking this. I can already tell you one of the top 15 banks is planning to announce that they are banking the cannabis industry. They're, gonna, they're launching a platform and they're saying they're banking it, and that's gonna come out in the next six months. Uh, so I think the same thing will happen for you know, investment banks and you know, debt vehicles. It's gonna happen because people make money doing it, and as a result, the people who make money putting those products and exchanges together, they're not gonna sit on the sidelines. Great, well, thank you guys very much. Um, this has been a really terrific evening. We have had some amazing presentations and talks tonight. I want to thank you guys for coming.